Hello, and welcome everyone to um, our annual Mark Smartowski lecture. It's about number 26, I think. Welcome also to the people on Zoom. Um, I just wanna say a few words uh, before introducing our distinguished speaker, whom I'm just delighted to have here um, for today's talk. Uh, Mark Swartovsky was uh, a um, beloved professor here at the Graduate Center and at Baruch College uh, following a long career at Boston University. And um, apropos of today's lecture, I wanted uh, to uh, sort of point to some interrelations uh, that he has with uh, both the topic and with the speaker. Um, Marx and I were, um, able um, in 1973 to start putting together the first collection on feminist philosophy called Women and Philosophy, which features an important article by Alison Jagger. And, um, and he also, of course, as you know, we've had um, Tommy Shelby and so forth. So this came out originally as the, uh, the feminist philosophy one, Women and Philosophy, toward a theory of liberation, as we used to put it, uh, came out as um, uh, the a special issue of the Philosophical Forum. And then a subsequent issue was on philosophy and the Black experience, which is why I mentioned Tom Shelby, who was uh, recently here as a Mark Swartowski lecturer. And so he, he had very strong political commitments to uh, the situation of various oppressed groups. And he was very, uh, had a lot of foresight in actually suggesting to me that we put together that issue. Um, and so I'm sort of reflecting on um, how he came to those uh, perspectives. He was uh, a red diaper baby uh, and from that milieu, um, there was, of course, a concern with exploitation and with oppression. So he was very early to come on the scene to support these diverse directions in philosophy. He also um, trained uh, with, at, at Columbia, which had a big emphasis both on history of philosophy and also integrative methods in philosophy, not only analytic, but continental. And his use of a dialectical method was important. Uh, perhaps most important was his, his philosophical work, which we're putting together, Michael and I, um, as finally we're getting it out, the collection Historical Epistemology. And what that was, was one of the first, he, Marx, Wartowski used Marx's, the other Marx's, his, historical materialism as a, a motivation for elaborating a philosophical approach that really put front and center the idea of social construction. And so he was in the first, one of the very early social epistemologists and his work is, is quite revealing about the idea of constructivism in uh, not just in about political and social philosophy, but in the philosophy of science and in aesthetics. And he works out a very interesting theory there with regard to the uh, also developmental psychology with regard to the use of artifacts in the process of uh, constructing our under representations um, of the world and models, which was also a title of one of his books. The, the thing that was distinctive about his view, which I think still needs to be taken up more by philosophers is the emphasis on historical epistemology, not just social epistemology, but historical, which is the claim that not only does the content of our knowledge change, obviously historically, but the very modes and forms of our understanding do, and in important ways, um, and also in relation to ideologies, which will be a theme today. The last little note I wanted to mention was about migration, because coming from that milieu, of uh, you know Jewish intellectuals of that period, red diaper baby types. His parents were both sweatshop workers in the millinery trade, uh, literally sweatshops. And so I think that uh, he discovered his, um, or you know this this supported his commitment uh, to theorizing exploitation and oppression philosophically. Uh, so that's what I want to say about Marx today, and that gives me a great opportunity to 
<clears throat> transition to our very distinguished speaker. So Alison Jagger is Emerita Professor of Distinction in the Departments of Philosophy and of Women and Gender Studies at the University of Colorado. Um, and she was, has been very active in um, abroad also. Um, she was a, a distinguished research professor at the University of Birmingham. And, um, but for us, I think, or for me personally, um, it was her work uh, in socialist feminism and in the, just the very idea of feminist philosophy, which we all had to justify at the time, I recall, and it's still being justified, endless process apparently. Um, so she was very, uh, very much uh, a leader in that, uh, in that um, process. And um, uh, she was one of the ones who shaped the very idea of critical gender studies. So uh, we're um, recently, Allison has continued her uh, pathbreaking work to apply it to global justice and the role of women in the global political economy and in uh, also now, I suppose, in the context of migration, which we're going to hear about today. Um, so she is really one of the main theorists of gender and global justice and how the, it disrupts neo-colonial gendered and racialized assumptions about transnational divisions of labor and migration, citing her. Um, so I, I wanted to mention some of her early books, uh, but <laughs> I don't have the list. Uh, Feminist Frameworks was the first. Yeah, you might also be running out of yeah. <laughs> well, it's the only time of year that I indulge in the in the memory of Marx oh, and yeah. the inspiration he provides. So um, <clears throat> I will mention, though, her most recent book. Uh, there we go. I wanted to mention Fe Feminist Politics and Human Nature, which I recently assigned in a graduate seminar here. I recommend it to everyone. All of the work is really not outdated at all. So it just proves the point that in philosophy, you can get better and better with age a la Kant rather than, you know, other professions where it necessarily goes the other way. So uh, she's currently working on a co-authored book tentatively titled Undisciplining Moral Epistemology, Justifying Moral Claims in a Diverse and Unequal World. So with all that said, please join me in welcoming Alison Jagger on the topic philosophy and migration justice, working to decolonize the Anglophone canon. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you so much, uh, um, Carol. Can everybody hear me okay? The mic's quite a long way from my mouth. Does everybody have a handout? I can see someone at the front here doesn't. Are there any more handouts? <clears throat> Having made them, you might as well have them and also follow along. and see that progress is happening, at least through this lecture. Okay, well, <clears throat> it's a really an honor to have been invited to deliver this year's Marx Wartowski Memorial Lecture. And it's even more special that I'm doing it on International Women's Day, which began in the city over a hundred years ago with a, a garment workers strike. So, um, I never really knew Marx. He was senior to me, but I, I have a, an image of him. He was a very striking looking figure. Uh, Carol probably agrees. Um, but I was a young uh, faculty member and grad student, and I just looked at him with awe, and I'd kind of just hover on the edges of his circles, like, you know, at, at the APA. Um, but what I, Carol, a little preempted what I especially wanted to say, which was I just so much appreciated the fact that he was one of the first senior philosophers to recognize the importance of doing philosophy from a feminist perspective, rather than just ridiculing this project as often happened in those days. And I was just thrilled to have one of my earliest articles uh, published, as Carol said, in the journal he edited, Philosophical Forum, way back in 1975. So I'm just glad that Marx's memory is living on 
not only in his important work, but also in this lecture series. Now I'm going <clears> to <throat> turn to the actual talk. So I am just a little bit quirky. So <clears throat> with the introduction, the topic of migration is constantly in the headlines of the United States and most Western European countries. And migration into these countries is frequently declared a crisis and sometimes even an invasion, a framing that's already problematic because it suggests it's a crisis for the receiving countries as opposed to the people who are migrating. My talk focuses on how this topic of migration justice gets discussed by mainstream Anglophone philosophers. In my view, the way that we in our profession uh, frequently discuss it is biased in several ways. But today I'm just going to focus on one of them, namely what I regard, will argue is colonial bias. I argue that the discussion of migration by Anglophone analytic philosophers is deeply biased because it obscures consideration of the ways in which current migrant flows are inseparable from Euro-American colonialism and neo-colonialism. So if Anglophone philosophers are going to develop more adequate understandings of migration justice, we've got to revise our conceptual frameworks and reasoning methods. And at the end of the talk, as you can see from the handout, I'm going to point to a growing body of work by transnational feminist philosophers on this topic, that even if it's not always um, self-described as decolonial, it's definitely moving in decolonial directions. Addressing migration justice more fairly is one part of the much larger task of decolonizing our political philosophy. My talk's building on Charles Mill's 2015 article, Decolonizing Western Political Philosophy. And last time when I spoke here at the Grad Center, I looked up when it was, and it was um, 2018, just before the pandemic, when uh, Charles and Linda Olkoff invited me to an event they were hosting. And I'm just very sad that Charles uh, can't be here today but if he were, I hope he'd be pleased by how I'm building on his work. At least he isn't here to criticize and say I didn't get it right. <clears throat> so we all know that the term decolonization has become pretty trendy. Often it can function as a kind of virtue signaling and it can make other people roll their eyes. Uh, what decol the word decolonization means is both contested and also context dependent. And in this context of academic philosophy, what I mean by decolonizing a philosophical tradition is working to remedy biases in the tradition that result from people who practice it having ignored or misrepresented salient features of colonialism, imperialism, and neocolonialism. And so, as you know, today I'll argue that much of the Anglophone debate on migration justice is biased for just this reason. And then, um, as I said, I'm going to end by pointing to some emerging feminist work that's beginning to remedy this bias, which is fitting on International Women's Day. So that was the introduction. Now on to um, the second section, how mainstream Anglophone philosophers address migration justice. When I was an undergraduate or a, grad or a young faculty member, it just wasn't a topic at all. But since the 1990s and the collapse of the former Soviet Union, the topic of migration has come increasingly to the forefront of Anglophone philosophy. A new work is constantly appearing. It's almost like a mushrooming field. So in all of this work, how are we gonna determine which parts of this flourishing debate are mainstream or canonical and which are not? 
<coughs> and I suggest that the mainstream or the canon consists in whatever writing has to be invoked by people writing on the topic in order to situate themselves. Um, and so my uh, strategy for identifying which in this area are persistent or have become classic ideas is to appeal to the authoritative Stanford Encyclopedia of <laughs> Philosophy. I, so I'm taking as my foil um, the Stanford Encyclopedia entry titled Immigration that was written by um, political philosopher Chris Wellman. The entry was first published by him in 2010, and it got revised in 2019. And as I put here on the handout, it presents much Anglophone philosophical thinking about migration justice as revolving around shared understandings of four things. And those are, what's the main ethical question at stake? What's the context in which this question rises? What's the appropriate method for trying to answer this question? And <clears throat> what constraints must there be on morally acceptable answers to the question? Um, and I'm gonna argue that decolonizing our thinking about migration justice requires revising all those four shared understandings. I think they're biased. Um, so first, the question. What's the main question? Wellman is pretty clear. The question for him is, do states have a moral right to exclude potential immigrants? He knows that those aren't the only questions that get discussed, you know, this treatment of refugees, a bunch of questions, but he thinks those are derivative or secondary. He calls them applied questions. And I won't even list them here because of time. The main one is, do states have the moral right to exclude, to, to close their borders? Second, what's the context in which this question arises? Framing the issue in this way already presupposes a certain context. And that context is the neo-Westphalian conception of the global order as a collection of discrete sovereign states tempered by the rules-based United Nations Charter System of International Governance, which got, as you know, established after World War II. So <clears throat> on this model, the relations of sovereign states with each other are taken to be contingent. The existing political geography is taken as fixed. And the default assumption is that states legitimately control their borders. Philosophers, including Wellman, obviously recognize that the real world is a lot more complex than this, this bare schema. But building theories often requires constructing simplified models. And mainstream philosophers assume that this neo-Westphalian model that I just indicated includes just those features that are relevant for addressing the central questions of migration justice, while pairing away other issues as white noise. I hope you guys don't mind, but it's so warm in here, I'm gonna take my jacket off. I was prepared for a colder New York and a colder room and not so many people breathing. Um, <clears throat> third, the reasoning method by which to address this right to exclude question. As described by Wellman, the method of reasoning used by most Anglophone philosophers is to start by art articulating a few broad political ideals or principles to which philosophers can appeal in then uh, applying them, assessing the justice of particular admissions policies. And this style of reasoning, which is a prioristic, starting with the principles and top down, has to, by its nature, focus on commonalities among migrant flows. 
rather than differences. So it conceptualizes migrants as abstract bearers of human rights, bracketing demographic categories like race, gender, ethnicity, religion, and so on. And it assumes that states are situated similarly to each other. When states occasionally do get described in the literature as poor or rich, failing or well-ordered, those attributes are treated as individual properties of states, not as relational properties. And as I noted already, Anglophone philosophers, of course, like all of us, are perfectly well aware that the real world's not captured in this bare schema. They know as well as anybody else that populations differ demographically, demographically within states as well as among them, and that states vary widely in their histories, power, wealth, and internal composition. However, they assume those differences are morally unimportant. They're not relevant you know, for the main philosophizing that we're doing. And so, uh, given this, the way the question's set up, the deductivist method of methodological reasoning is the, is the most appropriate uh, methodological tool for addressing migration justice. Finally, <clears throat> number four here, the moral constraints. Wellman's survey in the Stanford Encyclopedia article makes it clear that the normative framework on which most Anglophone philosophers rely is liberalism. Now we know that liberalism originated as a theory for governing states' internal affairs, um, but many liberal elements are included in the UN charter system of global governance. Within this uh, system, human individuals continue to be the main bearers of moral value, they who count morally individual people. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights promotes, promulgates a universalist morality of individual equality and liberty. So you can see it's kind of intended to be in a way liberalism on a global scale. Relations among states in the UN charter system are regulated at least nominally by liberal democratic values. Each member state has a seat in the UN General Assembly and each state's actions are constrained by international law established by treaties. Uh, UN law is, is treated or contract law. So now just to spell out the main debate as it's presented in this uh, Stanford Encyclopedia article in just a little more detail. So what Wellman does is, um, I mean, it's a pretty clear readable article. He identifies two main positions in the debate over the right to exclude, and they are the closed and open borders positions, often called nationalist on the one hand and cosmopolitan on the other. And both sides in this debate rely on the above noted understandings of, they both, they argue, but they both agree on uh, what is the main ethical question at stake, the right to exclude. They agree on what's the context in which this question arises. They agree on the method for addressing the questions and the need for liberal constraints on any acceptable answers. So as well and presents them, the closed borders position is far and away the majority view among Anglophone philosophers, and he gives that a lot more space. But defending the closed borders view poses a difficult challenge for liberals because it requires them to reconcile their defining characteristic to universal moral equality with the inequality that's inherent in weighting the interests of compatriots more heavily than the interests of those of foreigners who want to come in. So in order to develop morally acceptable arguments for preferring compatriots to foreigners while trying to still avoid illiberal prejudices like racism, 
liberal nationalist philosophers rely on a particular interpretation of what it means to be a nation or a people. So they conceptualize a nation, not as an ethnos, a group sharing an ancestral culture, but rather a demos, the citizenry of a democratic polity whose members all share equal civic standing. So a liberal people under liberal nationalist position can be ethnically diverse or religiously diverse and so on. But what unites them and makes them a, a demos is uh, loyalty to the ideals of liberal democracy. Conceiving the peoples of liberal states as demoi enables liberal nationalist philosophers to develop a range of arguments for excluding foreigners while not saying, you know, not saying it's due to the color of their skin, um, avoiding over racism and ethnocentrism. So it's a big literature. Wellman surveys 10 arguments in support of closing borders, which I'm not going to discuss now, but I'll just give you their names to so you have a sense of what they are if you haven't read this article. So they are preserving the culture of the receiving society, sustaining its economy, distributing state benefits, maintaining political solidarity, rejecting responsibility for protecting the rights of foreigners, political realism and indirect cosmopolitanism. And in elaborating these arguments in support of the right to exclude, the arguments all appeal to big liberal values like equality, democracy, self-determination, freedom of association, especially freedom of association, which is Wellman's favorite if you've read his work. Um, so they all contend that restricting immigration is necessary for safeguarding the security and even the survival of liberal states. For liberal philosophers, it's not as hard to argue for open borders, at least con it's conceptually more straightforward because the open borders people do not have to justify compatriot preference. Nevertheless, very few Anglophone philosophers defend open borders and Wellman gives a lot less space to this position. He mentions only three, Joseph Cairns, Philip Cole, and Abizade, sorry, I can't read, Abizade, 2008. And he identifies only four arguments that they have, which are cosmopolitan egalitarianism, libertarianism, the demographic right, democratic rights of farmers, and uh, utilitarianism. But they too, are, they're spinning them differently, but they too are appealing to liberal values like moral equality, equal opportunity, individual democratic rights, and so on. So as I said, although differences exist within, as well as between the nationalist and cosmopolitan positions, they both rely on shared, and at least as presented by Wellman, shared understandings of the main ethical questions at stake, the context in which they arise, the method for addressing them, and the need for liberal constraints on any acceptable answers. Both sides treat individuals as generic bearers of universal rights, and they conceptualize states as discrete collectivities, collectivities whose distinct interests can be harmed or helped by migration. And I'm obviously going to say that this framing simplifies real world migration situations to the point of obfuscation. It obscures what the relevant issues are. When migration is addressed at this level of abstraction, it takes populations as given and borders as fixed. By focusing exclusively on the present, 2023 now, or the 21st century even, it closes off any historical questions about how populations were constituted, how ethnicities evolved, when states were established, 
and how their borders were drawn. There isn't any space for asking how some states became so rich and some so poor. How did the regions of the modern world come to be divided first into colonizing and colonized, later into the three worlds of the Cold War, and later still into global north and global south? The mainstream philosophical debate on migration directs our attention away not only from differences among migration flows, but also away from the background histories and geopolitical structures that shape those flows. The abstract and a prioristic methodology of the mainstream debate allows Anglophone philosophers to ignore the historical and ongoing relationships among various populations and states even though those relationships have molded the very identities of peoples and states, made them what they are and continue to shape and reshape them. The mainstream discussion just treats all this as not relevant to migration justice. And this is obviously wrong, uh, as you'll see from considering two sets of empirical questions about contemporary migration flows. And they're right here in section four. Now, push-pull accounts of migration are um, a simplistic, but I'm gonna just use them just to simplify the situation. And um, to start with <coughs> question one here, why do they, all in scare quotes, leave their homes? Um, what are the push factors for contemporary migration? I'll start by reminding you of the poem that's become emblematic among supporters of migrants. And it's um, here on uh, page one, or under that butterfly. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. Uh, Wasan Shire, who wrote this in 2009, is a Somali British citizen now, probably, but she was born in Kenya, probably in a refugee camp, the very large refugee camps in Kenya for people leaving the Somali um, wars. So why do they leave their homes? What are the push factors? Some migrants are fleeing natural disasters or civil unrest. Others are seeking opportunities better than what they have available in economies that are plagued by stagnation and corruption. However, unrest, poverty, and incapacity to deal with disaster are not distributed randomly among states. Instead, they disproportionately afflict many former colonies whose vulnerability to these problems is often related to their former colonial status. For instance, some former colonies were left with arbitrary borders, which deprived them of natural resources or trade outlets, divided some ethnic groups, which you can even see on the US-Canada border, um, and uh, threw other groups uncomfortably together. These original sins of colonialism continue to generate communal conflict and refugees. A famous example is the communal conflict that followed the departure of the British from the Indian subcontinent. But another much more contemporary and very distressing example is provided by Cameroon today, where the former colonies of um, Britain and France have been put together in one country called Cameroon, and where there's currently a, a vicious civil war raging. Anglophone ethno-nationalists often contrast our, all this is in scare quotes, rule of law, with the gangs and corruption that are rampant in places like Honduras and El Salvador. But why are societies in the global south not liberal and democratic today? One reason is that powerful countries have long armed autocratic rulers friendly to their interests. In the past, these included Sani Abaka of Nigeria and Mbutu Sesiseko of Zaire, 
Today, you might include among these some of the current Gulf states and Saudi Arabia. The inequality, authoritarian rule, and massive human rights violations that plague many states in Latin America have been facilitated by past United States intervention. And even today, the US has, continues to subsidize and train their militaries. In addition, many migrants today are fleeing countries where powerful states continue to engage in direct military action. All these interventions reinforce why there's a gap between the liberal West uh, and the non-liberal rest. There are also forms of neo-colonial engagement which are less evident because they're not directly military. Some powerful countries make systematic contributions to conflict in the global south by purchasing raw materials from corrupt and authoritarian rulers, thereby incentivizing coups and the civil conflicts that characterize the so-called resource curse, where a classic case would be the Democratic Republic of Congo. But you might even ask, is, is Ukraine suffering from the resource curse? It's a question, a few philosophers recognize this, but not many, and they're not mentioned in the Stanford Encyclopedia article. In addition, and just to end this section, climate change is increasingly a factor in migration, and climate change is caused disproportionately by um, industrialized and often former colonial countries. So why did, why did they come here? I'll introduce this section with the migrant rights slogan, we are here because you were there. The journeys undertaken by many migrants are difficult, dangerous, and ruinously expensive. Migration disrupts and sometimes severs family relationships forever, and the lucky migrants who make it to Europe and the United States often face xenophobic hostility and racism. Yet mainstream Anglophone philosophers give little space to analyzing why there's such a disparity between the so-called global north, north, global north and south. They take it for granted that here is better than there, that we are wealthier and we offer more freedoms and better life chances. But why is life so much safer and more comfortable in most former colonial states. Once you ask this question, the answer is pretty obvious. The economic development of modern Europe was based largely on wealth from Africa and the New World. And this wealth was extracted via the dispossession, enslavement, and extermination of indigenous people and by transatlantic slavery. Throughout the 18th century, England, France, and Spain prospered from Caribbean sugar plantations worked by enslaved or indentured people. In the 19th century, the wealth of the US was based on cotton worked by African slave labor. Today, moving to the present, many wealthy states continue to be enriched by a global order that's plausibly neo-colonial. Many economies in the global South rely on extractive industries and sell oil, gas, gems, metals, and rare earth minerals to the global north under conditions that are exploitative and usually corrupt. There have been several recent exposés of the theft of Africa's wealth by corrupt governments and huge multinational corporations. Billions of dollars of Africa's wealth are regularly extracted by those outside it, mainly through corporations repatriating profits or by illegally moving money out of the continent. Gillian Brock describes how less developed countries are losing hundreds of billions a year through tax evasion and avoidance, mainly on the part of multinational corporations. When their wealth is taken from the global south, it's not surprising that they follow the money to the north. So these are just some simplified and I'm sure familiar examples of the ways in which colonialism and neo-colonialism contribute to the push for people to leave former colonists and the pull for them to enter states 
that often have a colonial history. Colonialism and neocolonialism are not the whole story, but the extent of their contributions deserves to be considered by philosophers working on migration justice. Um, so what I'm going to argue in sections five and six here is that fair consideration of migration justice requires rethinking those four understandings shared by much canonical Anglophone philosophy. And so section four just gives some suggestions for how to start, and not section four, section five, and then section six uh, tells how some feminist philosophers are doing it, beginning to do it. So in the article by Charles Mills that I took as my starting point, the 2015 article, Mills argues that taking the neo-Westphalian order as a given is a form of colonial thinking. He writes that philosophers focus their analyses exclusively on nation states. When they do this, they obscure the differences between those polities that were rulers and those that were ruled between colonizers and colonized settlers and indigenous, free and enslaved. So I find Charles's point very helpful. And I have just added to it the additional point. His point is that focusing exclusively on contemporary nation states erases a history of domination. Those are his words. And so I just add that ignoring the neo-colonial present also obscures aspects of current migration flows that, uh, that continue domination and that may well be morally salient to determining just admissions policies. So I propose that philosophers develop an alternative theoretical account of the context that migration's happening in. Um, obviously different theoretical models you build different ones for different purposes. But for the purposes of addressing migration justice, I suggest that the global context be modeled schematically as an integrated social structure that's historically emergent and continuing to evolve. What is a social structure? It's a complex whole constituted by the relationships among its component parts, they're all connected. It can't be understood by looking at the different parts separately, but only by seeing how the parts work together. Modeling the global order as an integrated structure means conceptualizing it as a pattern network of social relationships within which the identities of the constituent parts are partially constituted by their interrelations with each other. For instance, even characteristics of states that seem unique to them, like their languages, their traditions, and even their populations, they've often been influenced by past transnational interactions, particularly in the case of formerly colonized states. A really obvious example is the frequent use of English as an official government language in large parts of Africa and the Indian subcontinent. So states are not fixed, natural, or self-contained entities that are just there, that just happen to be similar to, resemble, or differ from each other. They're interconnected and shape-shifting participants in a global system whose structure was produced by human practices and which, this is the key thing, can be altered by changing those practices. You don't just have to accept the context. So I, I suggest that instead of taking the global order as this given thing, um, it should be modeled as both historically constructed and crucially as susceptible to intentional change. Crucially, the background conditions that we have should not be assumed just, but uh, instead the background conditions should be subjected to critical assessment. Especially, I think we might question the legit legitimacy 
of the state's claims to territory on which they've drawn their borders and from which they're keeping others out, you know, particularly in settler colonial state, what gives them the, the right to occupy, let alone exclude. So I don't wanna suggest that the background situation should be modeled to highlight exclusively the influence of colonialism and neocolonialism, though we're just be begging the question and the causal significance of these should not be prejudged in particular cases. However, conceptualizing states, nations, and individuals in terms that are not atomistic and presentist, but instead are historical, intersectional, and dynamic is necessary for more empirically accurate and fairer investigations of past and present inter and intrastate relationships. Now to revising our reasoning methods. The issue of ideal versus non-ideal methodology is currently contested among Anglophone political philosophers. And both it's confused because both terms get used in more than one sense. The model of moral reasoning, sidestepping all that, the model of moral reasoning I propose is deployed by Iris Young, Charles Mills, and Elizabeth Anderson, among others. And so it starts not with these big, broad, liberal political principles, but rather with concrete injustices articulated by those suffering them. And um, I think it may be related to the critical thinking advocated by Marx Wotowski. Um, this proposed non-ideal method is far from unproblematic. It doesn't tell us which populations are wronged in particular contexts or how to assess those wrongs. It requires empirical study of real world migrant flows, investigating which populations from which regions are going where and why they're going. So many factors are relevant to migration justice. So philosophers have to engage in teamwork with social scientists in a variety of disciplines, treating empirical facts as data, not just as illustrations. Philosophers should be especially suspicious of generalizations about how migration affects so-called national interests because migration impacts different demographics differently in both sending and receiving countries. For instance, paternalistic foreigners may express concern about brain drain from developing countries, yet the governments of those countries may encourage my out migration in anticipation of receiving remittances from citizens working abroad. For example, the export of domestic workers and nurses has long been a development strategy for the Philippines. And today the Sri Lankan government, which is beset by economic crisis, is also encouraging its citizens to work abroad in the hopes of receiving remittances that will strengthen its foreign currency reserves. Similarly, migrant farm workers in the United States are said to be indispensable to the US agricultural industry, but um, who is that industry saying that disregards the differing impacts of migrant labor on different constituencies of the industry, including employers, workers, and uh, consumers. So philosophers need to not just talk about national costs and benefits, but we need to investigate more deeply how these costs and benefits are measured to which sectors of the society, sending and receiving, the costs and benefits accrue. And who speaks in the name of states to say what's in the national interest and what isn't? So to reach more balanced assessments of migration justice, I think philosophers need simultaneously a finer comb and a broader brush. We need to examine specific migrant flows in more detail and also look for larger patterns among them. So our methodological approach needs to be bottom -up, up, historical and empirically informed, relational and systemic. 
which of course is easy to say, but not so easy to do. Enlarging our ethical questions, 5.3. By prioritizing the ethical question of the right to exclude, Anglophone philosophers implicitly situate ourselves as policymakers located within well-ordered, wealthy states facing a problem of uninvited intruders, you know, which is where the language of invasion and crisis comes from. And I want to say that the Stanford Encyclopedia supports this perspective because it's commissioned an entry called immigration. And at least so far, it doesn't have an entry on the more general migration. It's just immigration is the issue. So it's kind of structured into the volume. If we conceptualize differently the background context of migration and change the methods of how we investigate it, a much wider range of questions about migration justice come into view. As one example, we might want to question the moral validity of poor states' agreements to host enormous refugee camps when those agreements are made under intense pressure for wealthy states. For instance, since 1991, that's more than 30 years ago, hundreds of thousands of Somali refugees have been in uh, Kenyan refugee camps. And I think, although I didn't internet check it, that's where Warsan Shah was probably born. Since 2016, the EU has paid billions to Turkey to keep refugees out of Greece and Southern Europe. And currently, Britain's wanting to send people seeking asylum to Rwanda for processing. But one question is the refugee camps. Another question is whether migration justice might include reparative obligations, which are usually regarded, you know, in a Kantian framework, as more stringent and, than distributive ones, meaning reparative obligations have priority over distributive. Um, and we might ask whether particular states past interactions with particular populations might generate responsibilities that can be discharged only by granting admission to members of those populations. Characterizing the global order in social structural terms allows philosophers to deepen as well as expand our ethical questions. If we no longer take for granted the justice of the background global order and consider that instead of being characterized by uh, relations of reciprocity, you know, and UN liberalism, the background context might be characterized by relations of domination and exploitation. Then questions about migration emerge that go far beyond the right to exclude. We might question the justice of the global migration regime as a whole, asking who benefits from this regime, who's burdened by it, and what collective responsibilities it generates for all uh, participants. For over half a century, the main international instrument governing migration justice was the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees, you know, which which was um, um, established in the aftermath of World War II. And, and there was um, a protocol added in 1967. But this, the, um, the 1951 convention was notoriously problematic. For example, by the way, it posed a sharp contrast between political refugees and economic migrants, as well as in the ways, you know, that political got uh, determined. And in December 2018, the UN adopted the Global Contract Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, which aims to establish a new, better, more just, international fairer migration regime. Sad to say, but not surprising, this compact has not been signed by the United States. And uh, I, there isn't much that I've seen 
the Anglophone philosophers have said about it, it deserves more attention, I think, than it's received, received so far. 2018 is, after all, four or five years ago. The last uh, section, uh, the last question, point in section five here, scrutinizing our liberalism. As you all know, liberalism has been closely associated historically with colonialism. Foundational theorists like Locke, Jefferson, and John Stuart Mill were actively engaged in colonial enterprises, and they rationalized colonialism in some contexts. Even today, some liberal thinking about migration reveals neo-colonial prejudices of which some philosophers seem not to be aware or conscious. For instance, it's not unusual for liberals smugly to contrast their own self-ascribed liberal tolerance with Islam's alleged intolerance, their own secularism with Muslim theocracy, and their commitment to personal liberty with Islam's supposed rejection of the public-private distinction. These cultural stereotypes have influenced current interpretations of state security in the West. As we know, for most of the 20th century, the US interpreted state security in anti-communist terms. But today, security is increasingly taken to spelled out to mean protection from Islamic terrorism, despite the fact that most US terrorists today are US born white men. And in 2017, we know that Trump banned people from five predominantly Muslim countries from entering the US in the name of security. Well, I had another, what I think is a good example of um, liberal nationalist philosophers um, unaware prejudice against um, Islam. But I'm going to skip it now because of time and move on to the last section about transnational feminism. Feminist philosophy is one tradition of Anglophone thinking that Wellman ignores completely. It's just not in this um, encyclopedia entry. Yet although mainstream philosophy of migration barely mentions gender, let alone feminism, migration flows in fact are thoroughly gendered. In 2019, the Institute of Migration reported, here's a direct quote coming, gender influences reasons for migrating, who migrates and to where, how people migrate and the networks they use, opportunities and resources available at destination and relations with the country of origin, gender influences, all of those, plus risks, vulnerabilities and needs are also shaped in large part by one's gender and often vary drastically for different groups. End of quote from the International Organization for Migration. Feminist philosophers use gender as a lens for analyzing migration justice. And much of our work moves in decolonial directions. This is not to say that- well, I can't hear it now at all, so. <coughs> Who said that? Somebody on Zoom. I think it's someone on Zoom. Do I need to do anything? No. 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 <laughs> it sounded like Ed and Gary to me. Uh, no. Western feminism is not immune from colonial thinking, and some recent strands of Western feminism do have implications not for um, migration as well as gender justice. For instance, as we know, some Western feminists rationalize the invasion of Afghanistan in terms of rescuing women from the burqa. I have a, a philosophy professor colleague who said that. Um, since then, gender equality has been used as a rationale for weaponizing secularism against Muslims. Today, here's a quote, fem femonationalist feminists focus more on Muslim women's right to go bareheaded than on their right to wear headscarves, despite the fact that in many Western countries, 
failed women are frequently targets of gendered violence. And we might want to ask ourselves, given the huge support of Iranian women's rebellion with its slogan, women, life, freedom, are there mixed motivations for this support? And uh, is there, do some feminists want to co-opt this struggle? I'm just raising this question and I'm wanting to say, yes, transnational feminism definitely has colonial elements, but despite this mixed history and present, not all Anglophone feminists invoke colonial themes, at least since the 1980s, anti-racist, anti-imperialist, and post-colonial voices have been gaining influence. And transnational and decolonial feminisms are increasingly prominent in the 21st century. And in this emerging Anglophone, quite broad and varied tradition, feminist philosophers working on migration have often departed from canonical understandings of those four things, the main ethical questions at stake, the context in which those questions arise, the appropriate method for addressing them and the constraints on morally acceptable answers. And I'll end up by just uh, naming some of the work that's being done. <coughs> Starting with the methods. <coughs> Feminist approaches to migration are defined by their commitment to gender justice. That's it, that's what makes them, <coughs> excuse me, feminist approaches to migration. And we use the lens of, lens of gender to explore how gender inequalities, along with interlocking inequalities of class, race, sexuality, and religion, <coughs> excuse me, might be relevant to migration justice. Transnational feminist philosophers typically draw on social science scholarship, which enables them to incorporate the perspective, not just of policymakers in welfare country, wealthy countries, but also of refugees, migrant sex workers, and people in receiving states who are helped or harmed by migration. Feminist methodology, I'll just say without more examples, is gender sensitive, intersectional, non-ideal, and empirically informed. Second, reconceptualizing the context. Employing this methodology, feminists' um, work increasingly reveals that migration occurs in a global order constituted by interlocking structures of gendered injustice and domination, which provide the social context for gendered divisions of global labor. Many feminists have rejected on global care chains, which occur when women in wealthy countries hire women from poorer countries as nannies or caretakers or domestic workers. And then these migrant workers in turn solicit help with their own households from even poorer women or other family members. Participants in global care chains navigate injustices of class, race, and gender, which exist both within and among sending and receiving countries. The same is true of participants in other gendered employment like sex work. Oaken and Young have described these circumstances of cycles of gendered vulnerability mutually rein <clears throat> reinforcing each other in different areas of life. And building on this work, I have an article arguing that cycles of gendered vulnerability now operate on transnational as well as national scales. Third, re-transforming the ethical questions. By prioritizing the ethical question of the right to exclude, we've seen Anglophone philosophers implicitly situate themselves as policymakers in wealthy countries facing a problem of uninvited intruders. By contrast, using a gender lens 
very different ethical questions emerge. For instance, Uma Narayan and Shelley Wilcox explain how admissions policies that are nominally gender neutral may in practice disproportionately disadvantage migrant women. Alison Weir and Eva Kite explore the moral harms resulting from global care chains, prominent among which is harm to migrant workers' central relationships. <clears throat> and Kelly Oliver discusses the special vulnerabilities of women's refugees. In my view, some of the most important but difficult ethical issues identified tra by transnational feminists involve what have come to be called structural injustices. These occur when normalized social practices provide systemic advantages to the members of some demographic groups while positioning others to suffer domination and deprivation. Structural injustices cannot be reduced to the conduct of individual agents, nor do they result necessarily from deliberate institutional planning. Instead, they often just emerge unplanned from complex patterns of social interaction. And I'll give a few examples. The value attached to caring labor diminishes at the lower ends of the global care chain until that labor at the bottom end eventually becomes unpaid. So in this process, effective labor and resources get transferred from poor to rich countries, resulting in what one author called a global heart transplant. The caring labor is, is filtering upwards. 20 years ago, I did an article which pointed to the ways in which women in the global south disproportionately bear the cost of producing the migrants you know, who try to get across borders and whose adult labor then contributes to the wealth of the receiving states. Serena Perec criticizes the overall structure of the global refugee regime, which violates the negative duty not to harm refugees by setting up a situation where they're unable to access the minimum conditions of human dignity. They can't even get in to apply for refugee status. And a former student, Corey, Ar Corey Aragon and I, have developed the concept of structural complicity. This offers a partial account of individual citizens' responsibility for injustices that keep getting generated over and over again by the configuration of the global order. If this keeps happening on such a large scale, how are individuals, how do we bear any responsibility we address? Don't fully answer this question. Finally, rethinking liberalism. And this is the last little section and the one that I'm most uncertain about. Although transnational feminist work is not integrated really into mainstream liberal philosophy. It might be compatible with more radical versions of liberalism, like the black radical liberalism that Charles Mills was working to develop when he died. Now Mills is, you know, he started out as a Marxist and his late career approach to liberalism is controversial. Some people say, you know, he trade the course, I'm, and it's, it, it's not decided. I'm personally uncertain about its potential. As I see it, um, transnational feminists have liberal and non-liberal elements, really. On the liberal side, transnational feminists often invoke human rights and have worked to lengthen the classical list of human rights, including sexual and reproductive rights, and a right to freedom from violence, as well as a right to give and receive care. On the other hand, transnational feminists, like actually me and one of my co-authors, are also wary of imposing Euro-American interpretations of rights in mechanical ways that are not sensitive to colonial history and ongoing neo-colonial projects. So um, 
In the 1990s, a global feminist movement using the slogan, women's rights are human rights, categorized many gender specific injustices as rights violations. But then critics with whom I have sympathy charged that the idea of women's human rights was deployed against some communities, particularly in Africa, in ways that were culturally biased and disrespectful. And I'm thinking particularly of so-called female genital cutting, um, which the, never mind. Transnational feminism is not abstractly cosmopolitan, but instead tries to consider the concerns of people who are demographically diverse and situated in multiple neo-colonial contexts. Transnational work, feminist work on migration justice, I think is implicitly and sometimes explicitly deo-colonial because it recognizes that sending and receiving countries have shared histories. It recognizes that we all continue to participate in a global political economy shaped by Euro the American colonialism, among other things. It's also aware that past diasporas have mingled our cultures and increasing numbers of us are transnational citizens with trans-border family connections. And finally, it emphasizes that our destinies are inextricably linked on economic, cultural, and environmental levels. In effect, a neo-colonial global order exists right now, and its diverse members share tightly interlocking, interlocking pasts, presents, and futures. This emerging global community is divided by inequalities of wealth and power that are inherited and currently intensifying. These inequalities are not justifiable via the core liberal values of universal equality and freedom. So, something to think about. In our present neo-colonial context, transnational feminism offers philosophers valuable resources for seeking to decolonize our thinking about migration justice. And I hope it gets noticed in the next Stanford Encyclopedia article <laughs> on migration. Thank you, that's the end. So first, it's a great pleasure to get to be in the same room as you, to meet you. I've uh, followed your career for a long time. <laughs> it's wonderful also to hear your great talk. Well, and I have uh, just one quick question. So you raised the point that theorizing about migration often <laughs> ignores demographic, demographic differences, and you argue for considering the role of empirical work on migration and of questioning the morality of existing social structures, among other things. This makes me wonder whether you think that trans people in otherwise wealthy but transphobic nations should have some priority in migration, especially in cases where they are at risk of harms like lack of access to life-saving gender-affirming care, or even threats of genocide like we're seeing in the United States. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that question. Um, before I set out on the trip, I said, I hope the audience doesn't ask me specific questions about the justice of policies, because I'm doing a meta level talk about the way philosophers talk about it. Now you're asking me to come down from the level I did my talk and say what I think, you know. Um, and, and I made a resolution not to do that. Um, but that said, I think um, it's the gr grounds for what counts as a political refugee, as you know, in practice have been broadened by many countries. And I think that having a, a, an endangered trans status is sometimes used as a, um, a grounds for um, seeking asylum from political persecution. Another thing that you might say is that, I mean, I'm not wanting to endorse the whole structure of Political, pers political refugees versus economic and so on. But one of the things that's often used as a grounds for um, admission is uh, 
family reunification. And you might think that heteronormative um, marriage laws also discriminate against um, people who gay LGBTQ, many people who haven't been able to um, participate in a marriage that's, you know, legally recognized. Does that answer your question? Sure. Um, I'm not really sure if I have a question or a comment or just like a worry. Um, so I'm just gonna like ask it in a very general terms. I think that you are obviously like addressing a very complex phenomena that is structural in many senses, but just talking about the philosophical part, this has to do with not only how migration is addressed by philosophers, but how philosophy is being done in general. So I'm kind of worried about how to challenge the canon, specifically if you are from the global south, because philosophers from the global south, um, we, we need to accept the canon in order to be hers. Yeah. And if we don't want to do that, um, to have like a bit more of freedom, for example, sometimes we came to the United States so at least in our CV is the fact that we study yes. ab abroad, right? Um, so for us, if we want to challenge the canon and be heard, like we need to choose between different options. That is like one, just try luck and maybe just fail uh, with all the economic consequences that that implies in the third world. Um, coming to the USA and that is, I think that is harmful by itself because we need to submit ourselves to an education that is itself colonial. Um, and the other, the other option is to, to just let, let the, the global North philosophers to do this instead of us. And in one hand, I think that's, that is good because they will be taking responsibility for something that is affecting other people. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's kind of detrimental to just having this passive uh, role and just waiting for them to do it because we don't even know if they are going to do it. Like I myself like, here in this building, I have been asked why I came here if I didn't have enough money to pay my rent. So I don't know, I'm just worried that because this is a structural, like it is difficult for us to know where to start. Well, it's a, a wonderful question. Let me make sure I've got it. You wanna say, or ask how to, um, intervene in the elite um, debate that's going on in Anglophone philosophy. And um, there are different strategies you can take. Um, and I personally don't think it's all hopeless, though slow. Um, I mean, as Carol kindly remarked in introducing me, when uh, she and I, entered for we're in graduate school, the idea of talking about, Carol had an article about how gender wasn't a philosophical category because it wasn't sufficiently universal. And, um, and so we were uh, um, like a, a sub-community ridiculed um, and stereotyped and not for a long time intervening in the mainstream philosophy debate. Um, but if I can digress, I've been going for a long time to the American Philosophical Association and more and more interest societies, including the Society for Women and Philosophy or the Society for Animal Rights, you know, these things would be um, scheduled on the margins of the big uh, 
American Philosophical Association. And then they were so popular, they sucked the audience out of the mainstream sessions. And eventually, you know, in that context, the, um, the mainstream started trying to engage with the issues that we were raising. But I mean, a decades long, Carol's nodding here, slow process. Um, Almost 50 years. 50 years. <laughs> 2020. Yeah, but I want to say that there's a huge amount of philosophical work on migration that's being done that's not colonial in this way, that's challenging it. All I'm saying is Christopher Wellman, the author of this article, hasn't heard of it yet, but he doesn't mm -hmm. think it's important enough to put in his Stanford Encyclopedia article. But it's there, it's, it's going on. And um, I just suggest um, finding ways to participate in that. And I'd be glad to help you with references of work that I think is really good, that's more um, relevant to real world concerns. I, you know, I could email you or something. Is that helpful? Yeah. I mean, just don't give up. Don't, I mean, I know it's, it's a problem. And I know there's an issue of citation practices. And if you don't cite Joseph Cairns or David Mill, you know, but you can just mention them and then move on. I mean. <laughs> oh, thank you, Alison. Um, Are you Michael? I'm Michael. Yeah. I met you when you were 14. You may not remember. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, I do recall. Um, hey, I'm Michael Goldwartowski, Marx's son. And um, I have a quick question. Um, and um, I really appreciate your framing or reframing of the fundamental questions that we're asking. Um, I'm wondering, um, so the blind spots of, of the Anglophone tradition in the 20th century, um, you know, included very much um, the question of, of colonialism and um, the question of, of patriarchy. Um, I'm wondering if one of the blind spots that we see today is around the question of um, the gendered and racialized um, and structurally unjust uh, system of capital. And I'm wondering if at the risk of, of um, you know, rehashing um, old debates, I think this is maybe, um, you know, an, an opening uh, to, to theorizing the relationship between capital and coloniality um, or between, you know, the, the ownership structures um, and uh, the relations of domination and the relations of exploitation that you're talking about. I'm curious how that might play out in the form of a liberatory movement around, say, um, global caring labor, or uh, some of the other examples uh, that you're referring to, um, and the liberation movements uh, that are joined today, uh, whether they call themselves liberal or not. Yeah, it's a, a big question. I don't really know what to say, um, but there are, uh, you know, reformers. The international uh, labor organization based in Geneva has now for several years had policy statements on domestic work and so on. So there are those kind of almost like unionist um, things. Um, I don't really know what to say in response to your question. It seems okay, like so you're asking me about grassroots movements with the potential to overthrow uh, Global corporate capital. <laughs> well, so so I'm a social scientist as well as an activist, and well, and I'm I'm curious can, about. Here, here's your opportunity. To tell us. Well, about <laughs> it's not not my talk, not my spiel, but um, I I am curious um, about um, sort of the relationship between these decolonial movements and um, movements of of uh, directly exploited um, women in particular and gender nonconforming people and and um, other people who are not cis men. Mm -hmm. Um, in the global political economy that you refer to, and how do we theorize the relationship between the taken for granted global order of the Westphalian states and the taken for granted today global order that um, succeeded the the you know the Cold War and and the war in communism? Yeah. And um, you know I think I would just say um, in addition as a as a point of appreciation I think Marx would be 
um, our marks uh, would be very pleased to see this happening on International Women's Day and, and to hear this conversation. Um, I'm sorry that he can't be here, but I, I think he'd be very pleased. Well, thank you. That's a very, I, I'm really touched that you say that. Thank you very much. Um, but the big question, I just, I have no idea, really. Um, what's, uh, the thing I'm thinking a lot about at the moment, and it just may be too off point to, to really be suitable for addressing here, but it's Ukraine. Um, really, uh, you know, I've been watching this Timothy Snyder history series and so on. And one thing that's really impressed me about the Ukraine situation is how much it's um, a product of um, pre-capitalist empires, the Viking Empire, the Polish Lithuanian, the Frankish, the Habsburg, the Ottoman the Russian, the Soviet, and so on. And, you know, I probably shouldn't say this in a professional talk, but it's just the thought that's been in my head the last couple of weeks is, um, you know, we've long said all history is the history of class struggle. But it's also, it seems to me, from my limited knowledge, all history that we know about has been the history of imperial struggle. And uh, I mean, we know what Lenin said, but you know how to mesh that together. Uh, you're the sociologist, I'm the philosopher, so we're always looking for theories and systems and so on. And I don't know, but for me, it's just a very um, urgent kind of pressing question. Thank you. We'll do one from the Zoom. Sure. Um, I'll just, we have four from the Zoom and I'll read out the first one. Who's it um, by? It's from Lea Diaz. And her question is the following. It's two, two questions. So first, what policies and strategies the EU and the USA should adopt in order to promote a more inclusive and compassionate approach toward migrants? Two, should we need to rethink our understanding of citizenship and nationality? So the first question puts into a capsule exactly the question I hope nobody would ask, <laughs> which was what just policies should the USA and Europe uh, adopt? Um, and uh, I don't know. And, um, Part of the reason I don't know is because um, I think there are interesting questions about what you take as given, what parameters you hold fixed when you're trying to, um, you know, address. I'm, I'm looking at you, Patty, even though you're not the I'm first. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm one of the um, philosophers that I, whose work I admire and I've been sympathetic with is Alex Sager at Portland State. And he has a book titled Against Borders. And, um, but rethinking, you know, if you even ask about what are just admissions policies, right there, what are you presupposing? You know, who are these entities, the EU or the US that, you know, get to authorize admissions policies. And, um, you know, I personally, as you can probably tell from my talk, would like to go a bit further back in thinking and question the, not be doing what Wellman calls applied philosophy, you know, taking various constraints for granted. But question, I think that's part of a philosopher's job is to step back and question the framework. So I'm sorry, Leodias, I can't really answer your question. Over here. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, this is more of a comment slash worry, than, but I'm, I will try to frame it as a question. So um, I was just wondering if um, maybe broadening um, our conception of migrants or migration 
um, would be another way to decolonize philosophical thinking about uh, migration justice. So um, I think there are, uh, in your talk, you mainly talk about um, refugees um, and migrant sex workers, you use them as examples of migrants, right? But I think there are like other examples that, so the, the example I'm thinking about is international students. I myself, I'm an international student. And, um, and I have to admit that like international students, like most of them are privileged to the, or like many of them are privileged to some extent, but like not all of them. And maybe like, it may seem ridiculous to like compare them to refugees or like migrant sex workers. But like, I personally know some people who are like, who would fall into all of the groups. They're not like mutually exclusive. So, um, and even the thing is, even if like some international, international students might be like privileged to some extent, they're also harmed by this whole migration system. So um, I guess my question is, um, I was just wondering how you might think about like maybe taking a more pluralist or like more inclusive approach to this, to our conception of migration or like migrants. And I wonder how that might fit into your framework. Thank you. Well, needs to be broader than that. So the philosophical literature deals with these two categories set up in the 1951 Convention on their political refugees and their economic migrants. But what also needs to be looked at is the enormous numbers of internally displaced people who are moving and then start and then refugee camps all over. Um, oh, just so the people on Zoom can hear you. Did I need to start over? Anyway, the question was, should the category of, how far should the category of migrants be broadened? And um, if there is a sense in which the categories that we have now um, normalize and reify the status quo of legal and illegal, documented, undocumented, and, you know, in this case, international versus um, internally displaced. So, yeah, I think all those need to be creatively rethought, but that's a very broad brush thing to say, and how to do that is not just the work of um, a philosopher reaching the end of her career. It's how to work for younger people. In, I mean, I do hope one of the main points that came across was that talking about migration justice is a multidisciplinary project. So that's all I'm going to say. It sidestepped your question, really. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks, Allison. It was a great talk, comprehensive. Thanks. But I want to ask a question about your topic, which is Anglophone, the Anglophone canon. And my one of my questions is: Is there the Anglophone canon, or are there multiple Anglophone canons? So, what about? Um, does Anglophone mean just what's written in English or? Yes. Only even though. Anglophone, yeah. Even though it may be in other countries that they adopt the writings that are written originally in English as the basis of their theories, but they're writing in French or German or whatever. So is that outside the Anglophone canon? Well, I just had to like limit my, um, target. And so I picked this article in the Stanford Encyclopedia. And I mean, you have to 
how are you going to say what's the canon? I could look at other people's syllabi, you know, that expand a bit. No, I mean, the question is, is there one Anglophone canon or are there multiple Anglophone canons, either in English or in other languages that are based on original like Locke and Hume or whatever the, the traditional analytic philosophy writers. So if they're written in other languages, but based on Rawls or whatever, is that part of the same Anglophone canon? No. It, that, if it's not done in English, it's not Anglophone. And there are a few, you know, greats on migration. The ones who are the classics are Karens, Walser, and Miller. And they're the ones everybody engages with. Now, there's wonderful work done by people in English and in other languages, but it's excluded. In, I mean, the, the Stanford Encyclopedia itself is a project in canon building. Right, but it doesn't mean that you have to buy into their claim that they are defining the no. canon. But I just chose to give a talk about it. If I were surveying all the stuff on migration in many languages. Okay, so it's not just what people who adopt a certain liberal point of view um, stand for that counts as making them part of the Anglophone canon. There can be people who adopt that liberal sort of set of common sources that you would exclude from your understanding of the Anglophone canon. Yeah, but I didn't build the canon. I'm not excluding them. What I'm saying is there's wonderful work out there that I, some I'm not aware of in languages other than English, but a lot I am aware of in English but they didn't make it into the Stanford Encyclopedia. So what is so that? So they're not canonical. And they've somebody else has to write better articles to enlarge the canon. So what about those written in English um, that are, let's say, from the phenomenological tradition? They're or not so? in there. They're not in Wellman's account. But right. Are you excluding them also? You're just adopting whatever he says? Well, as being what he says is my target. Okay. 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 Thank you very much for this uh, excellent talk. I have uh, two questions, but I'll um, mainly ask the second, but I did want to note it must be a family thing. I was also going to ask about capitalism. Uh, because uh, in terms of the current perpetuation of colonialism, I do think one needs to look at, at capital mobility and labor mobility yeah, and the priority absolutely. the capital flows have over any kind of labor yes. and that corporations can move uh, and do move um, very freely and then capital why and as well in terms of existing law and the yes. way it supports the, the domination and exploitation that's involved in the structure. So that would, I would love to hear you to discuss it more, but maybe later. But absolutely right. Priority yeah. is given to free trade. And as you say, right. free trade means free movement of goods, supply chains. You know, we, we've right. seen in the current pandemic how dependent we are on just amazingly endless supply chains of stuff, of goods, of raw materials and manufactured products, and of um, capital. Uh, yeah. You're absolutely right. And the, the way that intersects with, with uh, race and gender would be an interesting project. Oh, yes, more. there's millions yeah. of interesting projects. Right. That so just you, yeah, there's more get... work to do. But my real question was actually, uh, or my second question was, um, uh, I guess I would want to emphasize another potential of feminism that isn't that may not have come out enough, although you do talk about its methods. I think the methods can be applied to liberalism as well. And so I don't think that notions like rights and human rights should be taken in the existing interpretations, which are liberal. And so I think they can be reinterpreted in more relational ways. Uh, so 
um, in that respect, and so can the various other categories of political uh, philosophy, um, equality and democracy and freedom. And so rather than remaining just with a kind of critique of liberalism, and you did open the way to this, but I would just advocate for a reconceptualization rather than a rejection of some of the notions because uh, they also, by the way, were the result of struggle. I mean, they didn't just appear on the scene um, because people thought of them as ideals. I mean, they were placed onto the yes, agenda absolutely. through, through yeah. people struggling for them. No, it's just uh, really interesting. And as I said, that's so, uh, the, the last bit of my talk is where I feel like my thinking's still in flux. Just uh, last week or the week before, I went to the central division of the APA and I sat in on a very interesting session about the rights of nature. Um, and, uh, you know, how those are conceptualized. And Peru has the right to the environment broadly construed in its constitution. And then some other countries like New Zealand have given rights to just particular things like rivers, you know, that have significance for indigenous people. Right. But even if you, um, but rights have generally become more open to not being just claims against nation states, but uh, to understand yes. in terms of- Yes, and protections, and yeah, thank you. I mean, um, even if we're gonna retire pretty soon, there's lots of inspirational work to be done by the young people who are here. Thank you. Thanks so much, this was fantastic. Um, so I have a kind of two part question. Um, so the first, or a suggestion that I then wanna follow up with the question. So the suggestion is that I wonder if you would consider adding to section two in this list of these four shared understandings. Um, the kind of simple shared understanding of what counts as migration and what the concept of migration entails. Because I know there's been a lot of, there's been some kind of cool recent work by decolonial feminists, particularly in the African diaspora, writing about and trying to push at the ways in which our liberal and even our progressive conceptions of migration itself kind of presuppose some, some kind of dangerous shared understandings, right? Um, and my, so A, would you consider adding that? And the second follow-up is, what would you say is the kind of shared conception of migration that's operating in Anglophone philosophy? Well, I think it's easy to answer the last bit, you know, and, and I talked about it over here. It's crossing national borders, you know, which thereby, and the categories of documented, undocumented, legal, they're, thereby given legitimacy and, and reified just in using those categories. But I'm more interested in your first one, but I don't really um, know about it. Could you say a bit more about what it does? Sure, yeah. So I, so for example, a couple scholars, Sadia Hartman, um, Fred Moten, and in particular, um, this great Brazilian scholar, Denise Ferreira da Silva, in the particular, the latter, she's pushed at the way in which our conceptions of migration and globality in general depend on this presumption that global location can kind of help us locate and capture the historical and social essence of a population. So in some sense, locating where they are in this kind of spatial extended globe helps us figure out who they are. And that may fundamentally kind of like shape both our kind of states-based conceptions of migration and even our more progressive conceptions of migration that may kind of push us away from states, but still remain fixed on this idea that, I mean, you know, migration is moving from your home, which captures some kind of fundamental essence about you to this new location. But if we rethink migration as less, as kind of less grounded movement and maybe a movement that doesn't require those kind of historical, social, location-based essences, then we're on a different kind of terrain, right? So I don't know whether, I mean, I haven't read this author and maybe afterwards I could, you could come up and tell me and I, or email me or something, I could write it down. But um, as I understood what you said, she's interested in um, reinforcing spatial location. And one of my points is not just space, but time, historical location. And if she doesn't have that in, I mean, she, she probably has it in really, but it needs to be made explicit that it's to do with historical, temporal, 
as well as um, spatial location. Thank you. Thank you for a very stimulating talk. Thank you. And, but I'm left confused. <laughs> okay, so I heard what I understood as two very distinct lines in your argument. There was the empirically grounded, ground up thinking that's based on people's needs and the suffering they have and sympathy with them, fair equality of opportunity and moral equality. I understand that as being one of the foundations, but then there's the historical and the repatriative and the colonial. And there you're looking back and you're looking at the stories and stories are told by different individuals. And in colonial times, there were in countries where there was colonialism, there were winners and losers. And if Absolutely. you look back before the colonial times, there were certainly different winners and losers. And it would be very idealistic to think that before colonial times, there were, were ideal societies Absolutely, of great justice. Yeah. So what I hear is the empirical looking here and now at suffering and pain and human equality. And then there's the backwards looking, which to me is very muddled and messy and the colonial element. And I don't see how you're fitting the two together. Well, maybe I just wasn't that clear. I'm certainly not meaning to idealize um, societies prior to contact with Euro-American colonialism. I hope nothing I said suggested that. I, I kind of intended not to say anything about that. Um, I mean, really, my talk is supposed to be a meta critique. It's a critique of the way that philosophers, my tradition of philosophy, which is the analytic tradition, deals with migration. And it's, it's biased in a lot of ways, many of which I didn't even mention. I was just looking at the particular, what I consider colonial bias. And I, you're right, I did recommend an alternative um, method of reasoning about what justice might require, which would be, as you said, more empirically grounded and more bottom up, as opposed to deduction from big principles. But it looks to me like you're picking out this other anti-colonialism big principle, and you're doing what you don't want to do instead of doing this round up. And there was something, understanding how costs and benefits intermesh, and looking at those detailed fine-grained elements in what goes into the calculation seems very different from this backwards looking with distorted and romanticized and histories. They look different to me, that's all. Well, you know, I, I probably don't fully understand your question, but yes, um, I am trying to endorse a method that's empirical, but it's also value laden and it's, to use a philosophy, epistemological. So, with respect to migration policies, I'm advocating not just looking at what are costs and benefits to different demographics, but I'm also advocating looking critically at what get counted as costs and benefits. And even further back, who's doing the counting and who's defining what costs and benefits are. And that's my understanding of a philosophical project as opposed to, sorry, Michael, merely sociological project. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Alison. That was really a marvelous talk. Oh, thank Great you. Great meta critique. So I want to now move a little bit down from the meta level, uh -uh. <laughs> which I know you're hesitant to do, but it's right in there, it's in, in, in the implication. So part of the talk is concerned with the critique of those who do not understand 
that the global order is historically constructed. Or don't and, want to understand. Right? And or who don't want to understand. Either they can't understand or they don't see or they implicitly talk in a way that seems to yeah, yeah. Right, obscure that. Um, and that it can be changed. And I want to now push a little bit to the kinds of changes you think might be useful, very specifically in terms of the Westphalian system, which uh, reifies nation states and national borders. And I want to put all that in the context of an emerging movement, a really a network of movements that goes under the heading of abolition, abolition of prisons, abolition of police, abolition of the universities, um, and abolition, abolition of national borders. And just say one thing about those movements that I think is important. None of these movements, when they get really serious, say, let's just abolish these things. They are all, they're all talking about alternatives. So in terms of the abolition of borders, which is the which is ch fundamental challenge to the Westphalian system, how do, we, how do you want to think about the abolition of borders and the kinds of alternatives that might make things quite different in terms of thinking about migration? That's a, obviously a huge question, which I suppose I tempt people to ask by giving the sort of talk. Um, just in terms of the UN Charter, as you well know, it's a product of its time. You know, the period after World War II, and it was drawn up by the victors of World War II. And one of the concepts that it uses a lot is peoples. And it talks about people's right to self-determination. And that's supposed to be in context, you know, an anti-colonial move. But we philosophers need to question what are peoples and how are they defined, you know? I mean, ethno-nationalism, uh, provides a strong um, critique, a, a strong argument for keeping out people who are not our folk, you know, who are different colored, have different values, blah, 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 blah. So all of the concepts in the debate need to get um, challenged, but not all at once. I mean, you know, you can't throw it all out. It just has to be a sequential process. If you're, again, people understandably are pushing me to say what I think. Um, and what I think is that um, there have to be borders for administrative purposes. You know, if you're going to accept anything like rule of law, you have to have residents, you have to have a polity, people who can vote in various jurisdictions, and people who have responsibilities in various jurisdictions to pay taxes and so on. So there are going to be borders. There's never not going to be borders, but they're not necessarily going to be fortified and they're not necessarily going to have the kind of priority ranking that we're thinking of where national borders are the real ones. So there would be overlapping um, administrative units like the Rhone River Valley, um, which, which controls, I think it's, the, maybe it's the Danube. Anyway, um, there's always going to be borders uh, they're going to be um, but in terms of actual travel of physical people across them, I think they ought to be porous borders, not an abolition of borders, but porous. And don't please ask me exactly what qualifications I think somebody should have to go across which border but you can't even conceptualize, I don't think, a society without administrative borders. Does that address your question? 